Welcome back to the Physique Podcast, my people. Today we have another special guest, a very, very special guest. I have my girlfriend here Woo. on the podcast. Hi, guys. Honoured. Finally. What do bit, you mean, finally? I mean, I'm a bit upset I'm not the first special guest, but... You've been busy. We'll let it slide. You've been busy hustling in Bali, but we'll get to that. <laughs> Every time I've been recording, you've been busy. I know. So you can't even use that Could've as an excuse. Could have waited. Anyway. Could have waited. Nah. Time doesn't wait for no man. First of all, I want to just give uh, everyone a little brief understanding and a brief insight into to how we met. I would actually like your version of the events because I, I say it all the time. So how, how did we meet, Esther? It's very sporadically in lockdown. I don't know what lockdown it was, but we were in lockdown and life was boring. You couldn't see anyone, couldn't really do anything. And it's quite a funny story. I had a friend who was trying to be a coach and... You had a consultation call with this person. Who's this? Lee? Yeah. Oh, I'm mad. Yeah. And... I had a coaching consultation call with him, yes. though, didn't I? Yeah. And obviously he was one of my friends. I was like, oh, who's this Steve guy? Let me go stalk him. No idea who he was. And then I was, like, spamming his stories, seeing what was going on, whether he was stealing his client or not. And then at the same time, Steve was looking at who was looking at my stories. And it was me. And I was like, oh, who's this? And then he pops up going, yo, your quads are huge. Measure them. Literally. And because I was bored in lockdown, I was like, you know what? That's actually hilarious. And I want to know the answer to that question. So I replied with a video response of me fully whacking out the measuring tape and measuring my quads. And that's how it started. Yeah, there's a little like three to four minute period where I kind of thought, uh, I'm a... Went a bit too far. <laughs> Blade it on a bit too thick there. <laughs> Factor 50. But then... In the DMs, it's just photo, 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 photo. I was like, boys, I'm in. Great success. <laughs> and here we are. Three, three, three years later? This was in 2021, wasn't it? It was yeah. like March, no, it was February, March, April. Just before your birthday. February 2021, I think. Yeah, yeah. So I think this was like lockdown number four. It was when they had that stupid tier system. Like zone one. So we've been together three and a half years. I also met you when you weren't a coach. So mm. give people a little breakdown into what your life was looking like three years ago. So three years ago, I was in recruitment and I was quite ironically recruiting lorry drivers for a recruitment company. So I had my own set of clients and they would literally ring me up at like 3 a.m. going, got any lorry drivers? This person hasn't showed up, that's my job. And I was very good at it, to be fair. I'm gonna toot my own horn. I was absolutely great at my job, but I was being paid peanuts for a lot of effort. And then when I met Steve, oh, I'd come round his house and he's there living the life just on his laptop in the living room. And I was like, oh my God, I envy you. And I was like, oh, why do you envy me? This could be you. And then yep. it, it resulted in an argument. <laughs> was it? Yeah. Well, no, it couldn't be me. Oh, I wasn't qualified. Oh, oh yeah. it's too saturated. Oh, no, I have no experience. Yeah, that was me. There's no such thing as underqualified in this game. You learn a lot when you're doing it, to be honest, a lot. Like every year, if I was to look at back my programming or just like my check-in responses, it's like it's like an upgraded version of yourself. It's quite cool to look back on. But but yeah, that was my story. I was just in full-time recruitment consultant, would come and see Steve, which by the way, was a trek. We lived an hour yeah, and a half, away. hour and a half drive away. I was in Nottingham, he was in Worcester. That's a trek. Um, and then every single Sunday, it would be the same. You know, the Sunday scaries. Oh, I don't really want to leave. I don't want to leave you. I don't want to go to work every single week. And he was sick to death of me going, oh, for God's sake, it's Sunday. Here we go again. But yeah, that was it. And then one day you were just like, oh, let's just put up a poll and just see if, if five women want to help, want, need your help. And I was like, no way. And then that is when the argument started. I literally threw my phone. I was like, no, can't do that. Can't do that. People think I'm silly. And then left. He just clicked send on the poll of my story. Wasn't very happy. I left the room. I was like, sod this guy. He's ruining my life. Lol. Um, it's also very dramatic. I don't remember it like this. But... Yeah, well, I do. I mean, you have shit memory anyway. So I think I'm... I mean, I think the, the situation was far more relaxed than that. No, it wasn't. Because I remember I was so years. anxious. Mm. I was absolutely crap in my pants. And I was like, I don't even want to look back at the story to see what people have put because I'm scared because that's so rogue. Like, it was just so sporadic out of the blue. And then I got a hundred responses. And then I turned around to Steve and I was like... Told you so. Well, oh shit, 
I can't, I can't help 100 people for free, you know, so what do I do? And then I just kind of snowboarded from there. Did five people for free, then I charged 50 pound per client just to get experience. And then three months in of doing that alongside my full-time job, I quit it. And again, that was another scary thing. And Steve was like, you just got to hand your notice in because you're not going to grow unless you hand your notice in. I was like, ah, but I'm leaving stability. <laughs> oh, what if the clients all leave me in Monday? And I was like, no, you just got to back yourself. So I left that, moved in on my own. And that was quite literally the most chaotic time of my life because I was like fully going in with the risk and just leaving a very good, secure job. I That's think it. the turning point for me in regards to pushing you in that, in that direction was when you pretended for your fiat to break down. <laughs> To stay Iconic. Here. Iconic. <laughs> she literally, right, let me tell you this now. So the, one of the many times she was in Worcester, right? The Sunday scary day, okay. Back, back and forth from, was it Nottingham? Yeah. I don't know, yeah. She literally was like, I don't want to go to work. She rang her boss. I don't even think you rang him. You just messaged him saying, I messaged, my yeah. fiat has broken down. It didn't break down, but she was like, I can't be fucked to go to work. So I'm just going to stay here for a couple more days and just blag that this little fiat punto, which was a bag of shit, right? So <laughs> literally a just metal... Death trap, right? But the manager just believed it. He was like, yeah, that's no problem, Este. That's all right. Give yourself a couple of days to get it fixed down in Worcester. And then I said, and like, this is another thing that I always say to a lot of people, like, your job actually, like, trust me, they don't give a shit about you. And I said to Este, I was like, I guarantee you, he will not give a shit that you don't turn up to work over the next 40 hours. And she was like, nah, 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 nah. Oh my God, he's going to be so annoyed. Oh my God, it's going to ruin everything, blah, blah, blah. I mean, I was more scared that they're going to find out I was lying. <laughs> yeah. Like, I was like, I'm going to come like, back care. and they're going to fire me. Oh my God. <laughs> they don't care. I was like, people realise way too late that the job that they're doing now, the bosses that they have really don't give a shit about them. You're so dispensable and replaceable. And that was one of the reasons why I told you to just fuck off and do your own thing because you're just going to keep going around this revolving door if you don't decide to do something about your situation. Do you reckon you would have uh, you would have got into coaching at some point had you not met me? No. Is it re at all? No. Bad. I don't, I don't know. It's hard to say really when you were the one that literally quite literally planted the seed because I always had the impression like I always used to get dms like oh you've made so much progress yourself like I was doing my like documenting my own fitness journey across the years through lockdown whatever um and I'd built up quite a good following throughout that period and I used to get dms like oh my god you've made so much progress can you help me and I would literally just point blank refuse and be like no just go to a, a pt at the job at, at the gym to help you because that's not me so I was very much in my self imposter syndrome era I mean I still am most of the time but <laughs> yeah you suffer from it a lot man <laughs> like I'm so laid back I'm horizontal <laughs> with my business decisions okay I'm very much like long term goal delayed gratification and you're pretty much the opposite like, like literally chalk and cheese yeah I think it's like on a weekly basis something is happening and something's going wrong and oh the world's gonna end. this is gonna be the end of me and I'm like <laughs> Like, relax. The females listening to this, if there are any, they will they will late. I think it's a girl thing. Yeah, talk talk to people about how that first sort of twelve months was building the business as well. Wow, we actually broke up in those twelve months. <laughs> yeah, what was it like? I think it was what we met in the February. I think 20... we lasted six months, maybe. I think it was six months. Yeah. I don't even know. We don't really have an anniversary. I don't. Yeah, I don't really know when we got together. Nah. It was kind of because we were in lockdown. I feel like people were moving in together when they just met. We were quite similar in that respect. So we I have mean, no idea. It was idea. quite intense. Yeah. Well, I mean, I remember one day asking you, going, "Am I?" Because you went to your friend. Oh, like I'm with my missus. And I was like, oh, "Am I your missus?" And he was like, "Well, you're here, aren't you?" And I was like, "Oh, charming." Yeah, I've got a very different attitude towards like. <laughs> commitment my actions speak for me because i'm a terrible communicator especially when it comes to like feelings and emotions when you say to me oh am i missus i'm like <laughs> you've literally been in my house for the last six fucking weeks on and off every time you've got a spare moment you are with me like come on use your fucking brain give your head a wobble and that's what i think a lot of people would be like yeah it's pretty similar you know i haven't never i didn't really ever have the conversation and sit you down and go do you want to be, be my, my girlfriend, girlfriend? <laughs> Like, ever. Like, whatsoever, right? Oh, so and I'm okay with that because so we're here now. We're in Bali. We're living it. We're living up life. We're chilling, you know? 
It's all good, man. We're practicing a lot, so no baby making, but plenty of practice, and that's how we roll. But yeah, basically, the first 12 months, six months in, we actually broke up because we were lit, like, we weren't long distance, but we were just at an inconvenient distance. I was actually living on my own in Derby at this point, and you were still in Worcester. Yeah. You could never be asked to come see me apart from like once or twice. It's not never be asked, I was just busy. I, I was at a very busy time. Because like, right now, yeah. I like a the way that I build my business is like, okay, I outsource and I delegate where I can. Like back in 2021, it was a one man band, right? And that one man band required a lot of time from myself to keep everything running, keep the, the, the business functioning. And unfortunately, and a lot of men listen to this, it's difficult, even though we might want to, it's difficult to consistently dip out of your own routine to fit someone else into your life. So that was the crux of the reason why we broke up. And I was getting a lot of jip in the air, like, oh, you're always on your phone, you're always working, you speak to your clients more than me. And I said, babes, listen, like, my business comes first. That's you know? true, though. I think business, I think, look, business, so true. If, you're, if you're a man, right, and you want to look after the people around you, the way that you're going to provide and protect and be secure in yourself and be secure in your situation is by building your business to a point where you can look after the people around you. And I'm talking girlfriends, family, mum, dad, brother, sister, all that sort of stuff, right? It all comes from building a business that makes good financial income, that gives you the opportunity to do that. That's how I look at it. You have a slightly different view. Well, yeah, like, I mean, look, every girl would be like, oh, well, you'd ex at least expect to be, like, on the same level. But I wasn't at the time. And we just decided that it was just not the right time. We just called it quits. Because I was, like, in my infancy era of my own business. Like, I was getting really busy, but not to, like, the same level as Steve. Like, I was just est being, like, establishing my own brand, what I wanted, which, again, takes up a, a different amount of time. But... I'm always that person that would make the time. And Steve, you're better at that now, but you weren't at the time. You, he, we literally, on the day we broke up, you were literally like, well, you're never going to be number one because my business is. And I was like, well, bye. Let me ask you a question now. Savage. Nah, it's savage. it is savage, yeah. And I've already explained why that <laughs> is as a man. Right? <laughs> like I said, you should always be able to look after people in the area. The only way that you're going to do that is if you have a fucking successful business, right? How... What I'm going to say to you now, obviously, we're three, three years in, three and a half years in. Fundamentally, my principle hasn't changed that much, has it? Like, I still will make sure that priority is that I structure my business in a way that allows me to have time for her. Yeah. That's how it's done now. Which... The business still is coming first. It's just I've become better at managing at time. that balance. 100%. And I think everyone who starts out, right, the first two years of your business, especially in online coaching, should be the most intense two years of your business. You should be sacrificing the most you sacrifice in your entire length of your business journey. And when you have that level of sacrifice and when you're investing that much time, you aren't gonna have that much time for people, you know? And it's, you know what, it comes down to communication. I think back then my communication with you there wasn't as good as it should have been. Yeah. And that's probably what led to us breaking up for like, what, three months, two months? Three months, I think. Well, you'll know. And then, oh yeah, it was three months. Um, and then, yeah, in that breakup, I was, I just focused on myself, my business. Um, and then I just kind of got really busy. Like, I got really, really busy. And, and she then, got it. She understood And that. I kind of got it. But at the, same, at the same time, like, I would still delegate time for you. But you, well, you got that now. You're delegate fine. time? What am I, a fucking VA? Delegate time. Well, you're on about, front. you've literally said it yourself. <laughs> yeah, but I'm talking about my business. I delegate and outsource in my business so that I have no, time. No, for... I'm saying like, I was never on the, on the priority list like from the beginning. Yeah, you like, are on the priority list. I am now. No, you you were always on the priority oh, list. You didn't fucking communicate that very well, did But you? this is what I'm saying, Fuck right? You. So when I say my communication skills Jesus. weren't up to scratch, then that's, that's what I mean, you know? It's so like this drawing is blood out of a stone. This is quickly turning into a therapy session. But, Sports like counseling. I say, geezers out there who are, who are building their businesses, <laughs> and if you really have a girl in your life that is quite special to you, trust me, communicate your goals, communicate your aspirations, because I feel like if I'd have done that with you from the get-go, would we have broken up? Probably not. Probably still, I think. No, I but know. we would have actually maintained communication through that period, I think. I think that's what would have been the difference, right? Yeah, we would have been like friends, kind sort of Sort of like how it was in Bali last year 
It would be like that. It would yeah, be like yeah, a bye bye for now sort of thing. Yeah, but we didn't break up. No, last we didn't break year. up last year. But what I'm saying is, we, we didn't break we up didn't last year. We just weren't in the same place but together. But we just weren't in the same place together, but we were keeping communication with each other. So again, that was a communication situation where you go, right, okay, I'm going to be in this place for this amount of time. You're going to be in that place for that amount of time. And I don't care what anyone says, if you are in two different parts of the world, you're not having the same kind of relationship. Yeah. You're just not, but you are still maintaining a relationship. Yeah. So what I'm saying is if my communication back then was as it is now, that would probably have been the scenario. Like, we'll keep in touch, we'll support each other. But give me three months to focus give me on three my months shit. To sort you my shit do out. the same. Hundred percent. Yeah, I agree. That's what would the conversation would have been instead of seeing a bit, fuck off, <laughs> see you never kind of thing, right? Because that's what it was, right? So again, it all comes down to communication. Now whatever happens, happened, yeah. Fast forward, we've got back together. December. Only because he moved closer to me. Yeah, basically, I moved closer <laughs> and I was like, yo, let me like pop up, man. Do you want to trade? <laughs> Is that what I said? I've moved to Sheffield. Do you want to trade yeah. at Ultraflex? <laughs> basically, I went from Wor Worcester to Sheffield and I was like, well, Nottingham's not too far now. Yeah, it's like 40 What's minutes. What's up? And then basically, because we were that close, you still had your place in Derby and then you pretty much moved in to mine at like what January February I'd say maybe February or February yeah because I lived in a shithole <laughs> and then I got my car stolen that, that year <laughs> was it 2022 it was yeah 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 I got my yeah. car stolen that year my Jag F Pace God, the I missed trauma. that car the trauma but then after that we moved in together to a big boy house into a four bedroom house in Sheffield which was rather unnecessary but <laughs> I was making no. really good. I was making bank, so I was like, "Fuck it, I don't care." No, but also, I like fifteen came up. So also, I you wanted enough space to kind of yeah, I wanted have enough space to space. be away from you. You know, just a little trial period. Savage, which is ironic now because when we moved to Bali, oh, we now literally have got we've got now. I think. Look, most men it's will understand what it's what I'm saying. We have like uh, time periods where we're we're address we're addressing and adjusting the situation in front of us, right? And it's like a, it's a, it's a phase where we're contemplating our current situation and also trying to get to terms with and understand what we're doing moving forward. And we're trying to do that all at the same time. So you living it with me in Sheffield was very much a trial period going, okay, let's see how it goes. If I can live with this girl for the next four months, then living in a bigger house shouldn't be a problem. But living in a bigger house, you still want your own space so there's the mediating factor going, right, okay, let's move into a big house so that I can categorically have my own space as and when I want it. And it worked. And then from there, we moved to Bali. As you fucking do. You just move from a four bedroom house in Sheffield, halfway <laughs> very across the nice, world. nice, secure life. Chuck, nice everything into, chuck everything into a storage <laughs> unit and fuck off to, to Bali. Because that's what we did, like literally. And do you know what the funniest thing is? That process was like what? One month long, the entire process of it wasn't even that. initial idea to booking flights to moving out the, the the house to putting everything in storage was literally like what three weeks. Yeah, it was it was it was intense. Like, like turbocharged the fuck like, out of it because we literally got the message from the estate agents like, oh, do you want to renew? Oh yeah, they do put you want to renew? Up. Yeah, Fuckers. they put the rent up, so we were like, Absolutely it was already. By not. the way, can I say it was already seventeen hundred a month? Outrageous. And then they were like, oh, you, we want you to pay more, and I was like, are you Outrageous. taking the piss? And then obviously we said no. They then actually put it back on the market for, for cheaper. Fifteen hundred, yeah. Um, piss, piss ball. Absolute robbers. And that's when we were like, well, for what shall we do? Shall we find somewhere else? And then we're like, oh no, do you know what? Let's just go somewhere abroad. And the whole premise of that, we never had like. I mean, I definitely didn't. I didn't go. I didn't think. Oh yeah, we're gonna go to Bali. I'm going to want to live in Bali. I just thought, oh, like a, a nice time to focus on ourselves in a nice climate, come back, settle down. But it never happened. <laughs> and instead we came back and we were like, fuck the UK, let's sell everything and come back. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, there's a few contributing factors to that. Number one, I've wanted to go to Bali since I was about 18. Yeah, it was but like we both did. We yeah. both had the conversation. It was a destination that we both had in our, in our heads, like we earmarked to like go to and explore, right? So that was number one. And then when we came here, we were like, fuck, this is sick. Mm. We were like, right, we've got everything that we need. The facilities here allow us to be more productive. The time zone allows us to be more productive. The time zone allows us to have time for ourselves without having that anxiety and that, that 
back of the brain sort of thinking of, oh, we need to be pl replying to clients. Mm -hmm. And that's the difference. And that's where I see a lot of people go to Dubai and a lot of people go to Thailand when they're running online coaching businesses and their, their demographic is predominantly in the UK because you have that time in the morning to do your own shit. Like we're recording this at 12, 30, one o'clock. No one's fucking awake. awake so yeah. we don't need to worry about going on our phones to a ton of messages and a host of messages because that time zone that we are in allows us to do shit in the morning slash early afternoon when no one in the UK is operating and functioning, right? And that's one of the big reasons why we moved out here because you have, by, by virtue of how the time zone is set up, you have your own schedule to have your own time in the morning to train, to get ready for the day, to do things, bits and bobs. Like today, I've been to immigration already, right? Without even having to worry about my clients, I've been to immigration, come back, filming a podcast, then I will probably go and train and then I'll start work, right? Imagine if you had that, you can't even have that scenario in the UK because you're thinking about, oh shit, this is my, am I going to be able to like do this for an hour without my phone blowing up and all this sort Unless of stuff? Unless you wake up at like 4 a.m. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the only remedy, right? You wake <laughs> up really early again when no one's awake. But the, the, the really good thing about living so far ahead is that you can have that time for yourself, right? And, um, and that's really one of the big pluses of, of living in Bali. So, you know, the, it gives you that work-life balance that you don't really have to do much for. Would you say, in terms of structuring? Not really. I mean, I've got to do a little bit more now. I do PT on the side, mm. but that's about it. Yeah, so now we're in Bali. Obviously, you're doing the PT stuff mm -hmm. with Elite Fit. Mm -hmm. How's it going? It's uh, an adjustment. <laughs> an adjustment. <laughs> Just What's the difference between like PT and online coaching, would you say? I'd say, I'd say, I mean, from like an actual standpoint, PT, you can kind of help with actual training, but then that's it. Like one of my girl today was like, oh, what's the best thing for me to do to lose my double chin? And I was like, calorie deficit. Can't teach you that in the gym, love. It's, that's on your plate. Um, whereas obviously with coaching, that, that, that covers it, you know, because you get the nutrition too. Mm. So I feel like PT is great, but it's not, I don't think it's as personal as online coaching. It's not as like... Which is actually a very big statement. So you're saying personal training isn't as not, personal as no. online coaching. I think you're just, doing, you're just helping them do a job and helping them just lift weights, get a good session in. But if you actually want to make progress with your physique, with your mindset, with your discipline, it's the other things. It's your accountability. It's you, your actual dis discipline. It's you showing up on the days you don't want to. A PT, and our PT session is not going to teach you that. You know, so they're very, very different. And I think coaching is a lot more, like, in depth. Yeah, PT is very much getting And it covers everything, down. yeah. And I think it comes, it naturally comes with the stigma of being gym-focused. Because it's in the name, it's personal training. But I also think as well, like, if, if like, you really want to make progress, you genuinely should do, like, a bit of both. Because if you're, like, quite a newbie and, you don't, and you're a bit unsure about the weights, you've always wanted to do the weights... If you've got no idea about nutrition or about structuring your program, genuinely look for a PT who also does coaching because then mm. they can give you a hybrid approach so then you've got all, all areas covered, AKA high especially if Yeah, <laughs> especially if you're in Bali, get out my girl, Elite Fit. <laughs> She's offering a free PT session right now. Pick up. So get on it. If you don't know, get to know. Yeah, because I, I say a lot, a lot of the time with beginners, it's you, you have to understand the basics first. And I think that's where 100%. PT really falls into the nice, 100%. nice category to give you what you need. And then once you understand how to train and the fundamentals of training and the principles of progressive overload, you need more attention. Mm -hmm. You need more of an overview of your actual day and your actual week. And one hour in the gym isn't going to cut it. So like mm -hmm. 23 hours outside of the gym is far more important than the one hour that you spend in the gym. And it's about getting that understanding of, of priority correct. Mm -hmm. And then that's when people make a lot of progress. That's what I see a lot when I have online coaching clients come to me. They go, yeah, I've had a PT, but I've never really focused on the outside of the gym aspect. I'm like, well, let me take care of that for you. And that's really the biggest difference. Yeah. I work with a lot of mentees that come to me from personal training. And I go, well, you can just simply offer more. You can just offer more than just one session three times a week or three sessions a week or five sessions a week. And then outside the gym, you don't speak to them. Right? There's way more scope for 
accessibility, there's way more scope for accountability, way more scope for knowledge and actually giving them what they need to make the real progress that they want. Yeah. You know? So it's going to be interesting to see how you balance being a PT and a coach and how much more that's going to bring to your service because it will give you a different perspective as well. I mean, it already is. It already I mean. is, but I feel like, I'm not going to lie, I'm already like, because like, you're in Bali, people don't stay forever. And the whole reason why I took this opportunity was to benefit my online business. Because mm. anyone who goes back to the UK, goes back to, I don't know, Singapore, whatever, they're going to probably still want the structure. And that's why I'm like, well, that's, I do online stuff too. Hi. Yeah, it's very much a kamikaze approach. People come in, they'll be with you for an intense period of time, two weeks, and then they'll fuck off. No, they go back home. And your responsibility is to understand that as a PT. And I think in the UK as well, like you, if you are a PT and you've had a client for longer than six months, you're not doing it right. Yeah. Because a, C, a PT you should outgrow really, a PT. I yeah, hundred percent. A PT yeah. should be nil and void after six months. Yeah. Because 100%. you know, there's only so many things you need to do as a trainee, as someone who goes to the gym to understand the basics of how to train and then mm -hmm. the rest of it, the rest of your progress simply comes from looking after yourself outside of the gym. Yeah. So any PTs that have clients that have been like there for 12 months, you're either very shit at your job or the person just wants a natter and you're a counselor. There's one or two things. Yeah. And if you are a shit PT, then sign up to the Coach University. <laughs> Get to know how to actually structure your sessions and structure your business so that you can actually provide ultimate value for your clients. Now, let's talk about Obviously, the life that we're living in Bali at the moment, right? Yeah. And I want to touch upon the awkward phase before oh, God. going to Bali. Oh, and I think this is what actually stops a, a lot, lot of people. A lot of people don't do it, yeah. It's what stops a lot of people, right? Because yeah, unless life. you are living with your parents, which in my opinion is an absolute free swing, right? So if you are a coach right now who's making like two, three yeah. grand a month. Why have let, you moved? <laughs> let me be clear. <laughs> If you are still living with your parents and you are an online coach who is making two to three thousand pounds a month, why the fuck are you still here? You need to get onto the next plane out of this country because the UK is a sinking fucking ship. And if you are living with your parents, you have no risk, you have no liabilities, you have zero responsibilities other than your business. So fucking try it. Go live in Thailand, go live in Bali, go live in Dubai for a six month period. Because it, especially in Bali, doing six months here, which I'm gonna touch upon, is fucking easy. Like, I've managed to secure an 18-month visa by paying a sponsor. And by the way, there are 100 people to go to in Bali. I pay them a fee. They sort everything out. I go to immigration once every 60 days. And then I get to stay here for six months. And then without leaving, I get to extend for another year. Purely because I'm, I'm moving to different documentation of digital nomad visa. So that's that. Right? I just want to make that very clear. Now... <sighs> The time in between, let's take it back. So the time in between going to Bali and coming back is obviously when my dad died, right? So that's in itself very stressful. I was prepping at the time, organizing the funeral when I was prepping, rough shit, right? So when that was done and when that was out the way and when prep was finished, we were basically dipping in between your parents' house and my parents' house, right? And it was basically... Let me give you a very, very, very good analogy, right? Let's say you are in a situation and my decision is whether my friend fucks you or a stranger fucks you. You don't want either, right? You don't want either to happen, but one of them has to happen. And it's like, right, okay, which one do I choose? It's the best of a bad bunch. So it was either stay at your mum's house or stay at my mum's house. Both very, very unideal situations. Thankful for the patience of your mum specifically to make room, because there wasn't really any room to be we made. We had no bedrooms. Right? <laughs> so uh, fair enough, okay? M my situation with my mum and, and the living arrangements and being in the middle of Brackley, it's not ideal for anybody who is running an online coaching business. It's not ideal for anybody who wants a life. It's a town for people to grow old and raise children, right? That's Brackley for you, yeah? <laughs> so again, we had this for like, what, four or five months? Six months. Okay, six months. Six months of hell. I wouldn't say it was hell. It was hell. I mean, it was very stressful on our relationship. I mean, we... Like, we the fact quite, that we managed to get through that. Yeah, do you know what? Fist bump me, the fact, because <laughs> fuck me. 
We, I think we genuinely had about five arguments where we were like, oh, but it's communication. Well, if you're not happy, let's fucking end it here. We had about that six times, I reckon. <laughs> yeah, it was a weird time for me personally because obviously <laughs> oh, I was adjusting to Jesus my father's death, Christ. right? I was adjusting to my dad dying, everything oh. that comes with it, the fallback from that, the emotional adjustment from that, you know, and a lot of my business goals. A lot of my business motivation was, was to provide for my yeah. dad. Because my dad, let me give you a short example. When he was turning 66, he would have basically had like three quarters of his money just stopped, right? The pipeline supply would have been disappeared, right? Because it was the insurance money due to his accident from the Australian government, okay? Now, that would have just cut from one month to the next. My mum and my parents weren't living a life that was preparing for that. Okay, so I was obviously putting it on myself to be the, 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 the person who bridged that gap, okay? And I'm sure my brother would be able to, to chip in as well, but I was not going to take that for granted, right? So a lot of my business and my motivation to build my business was to basically bridge that gap and essentially, call it whatever the fuck you want, but essentially retire my dad, right? Even though he was already retired, but put him on the books, pay him a certain amount of salary and look after them, right? So when he died, I was like, like that for me was a big reason why I struggled, sacrificed with my business. And adjusting to that, whilst dipping in and out of your house, my house. Well, I mean, we also tried Airbnbs for like yeah. a month. So we'd spend like two weeks in one place, two weeks in another. And that itself was, it was, it was not good. We thought, oh, we'd have our own space. But if anything, it made us more upset that we didn't have our own space because yeah. we were like, oh, one week in, oh, we're settled, we've got the gym, and then we're moving again, and we literally were living out my car. Like, my car was like a wardrobe. Yeah. It literally was, that was it. Like, we were living it rough, actually, when you think about it. Like, I was sleeping on an air mattress at my mum's house because mm. I no longer have my bedroom. I've not lived in that house since I was, like, 18 years old. Like, <laughs> like mm. it's not like we came home and we had our own places and we had an office we had nothing we had nothing we had to work on the dining room table on the sofas like with busy households and it was just not productive mm. it wasn't productive yeah because that was that was after the period of where i came back from Bard and i was living at joe's house oh, yeah. big shout out to joe i like <laughs> so i can't even i can't even like words can't even explain how grateful i am for him for jazz for the whole situation i i don't think i would have been able to get through that period had i not had joe there had i not had the situation the environment that they gave me because you know i first started to to really grasp the understanding that my dad was dying when i was living with joe and the support that both of them gave me was incredible and i think i wouldn't have been able to get through that that prep and also the the aftermath of it all without the support of them too which was fantastic and i was because I wasn't actually there. You I weren't there, there. <laughs> and I, t I can't really lean on my mum like that for support because she's the emotional one out of the two, and I'm very stoic in my approach, so is Joe. And, yeah, the advice and the conversations and just the uh, the support that they gave me through that time was incredible. And, um, yeah, forever grateful for them too. Like they, they are obviously two of the nicest people I've ever met. And um, that was before, obviously, finishing the prep. And ultimately, I think the first time I really, really kind of, like, knew that my dad was gonna die was was in Joe's living room. I think it was in his office. I was actually there like, fuck. I was like one week out from a show and I should never have done the show, but I was like, and I remember telling you, I was like, my mum's my mum's doing my fucking head in. Like, I'm so glad I'm here. I'm so glad I'm at Joe's house. Cause you know, there was just that empathy from them and just- But also you felt quite a lot of guilt for actually doing that show because oh, because yeah. of the stress, you 100%. were holding on to a lot of water and should actually- should have, could have been your dad. I was absolutely spot on for that entire prep. And this is where like, I've Stress. got to give, I've got to yeah. give like you all the understanding that you are gonna make emotional decisions when it comes to being in prep and obviously the back end when you're like very, very, very shredded, right? Which I was getting there, right? I wasn't at my absolute peak level of condition, but I was getting there. And like I thought, you know what? Let me have an off-plan meal. Let me have a uh, what was it? A Jamaican from um, just down the road uh, from from Joe's house. And that was the only time in the prep where I was like, right, I fucked up, right? 
and again, it was never like the case of going, right, and I'm gonna binge out and, and emotionally resolve this with food. It was like, right, let me just relieve some stress, right? From a point of view of, let's have an off meal, let's just take the rest of the day off, let's not worry about it. And nothing was really fucking doing anything to save that. Like, I changed my, my whole physique changed in two days. Like, I went from looking sharp to looking watery as fuck. And yeah, you know, and that, again, the support from Jazz and Joe, they were very understanding. They, I had a chat with them, they were like, yeah, well, we understand why you've done it because it's stressful, but like, is this going to be a repeat situation? And I basically spent the, less, the next what, like four or five weeks proving to them that was the only fuck up, right? Because I'll be honest with you, yeah, living with your coach, right? I won't say all the things I always say. Living with your coach. Keeps you accountable as You well, can't right? fucking cheat on anything, bro. <laughs> like, it's impossible. Like, if you're living with your coach, which I was, right, there's no chance, there's no opportunity. So, like, that is literally the most adherent that I've ever been to my diet plan for that sort of six, seven-week period. And it obviously showed because i become razor sharp. I literally had walnuts for glutes. And, yeah, without that, I mean, I'm not saying that everyone should move in with their coach, but that, that was the scenario. And like I said, I'm eternally grateful to Joe for that within regards to that situation because it was a, a crazy time in my life. And uh, But now we are we're we're reaping the benefits of it completely. you know. And now we are literally living in Bali. Like This isn't a trial run. This isn't a marketing tactic. This is we are living in Bali. We, we have nothing in the UK. We have nothing. The UK is now no gone. Cars, like No cars, no, no attachments. No bills, nothing. Like the only thing that attaches me to the UK is my business and my mum's address. And then the same for you, it's your mum's address and that's it. No. You know, everything else is, nothing is attached to us. Apart yeah. from phone contracts yeah, and a Mac, card, right? Yeah. Apart from that, which is just capitalising on the, f the, 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 the finance situation that you can get in the UK. Like before we left, I was like, right, this is the time to upgrade the Mac. So I upgraded the Mac, we got top spec 2024 model and I'm paying it over like three years because I was like, well, I'm not gonna be able to replace this in a better payment schedule than, than that. It was quite funny this morning, actually. You, you, know, you, you don't even know this, but one of my clients messaged me. And you know how you get like the reels and stuff of like hotels in Bali? Yeah. She sent me it. She was like, have you been to any of these? And I went, no, because I live here. <laughs> Like, yeah. And I think for it's other people, set. it's hard to understand, like, oh, my God, how can you be living in Bali? But it's just quite funny because she was like, oh, have you stayed in any of these? And I was like, no, we've got a house. <laughs> like, we don't need hotels. <laughs> yeah, and that's the thing. It's like we've – I've definitely made the decision with our villa and our location to live like a local, right? We're in an area that is quiet. I wouldn't say like a local because well, that's, not that's, not, that's not true. Not living like a local, but we're living in local areas where – like even, I don't people think, no. Aren't. See, I don't even think... We, we're living in an area where expats live. That's where we're living. Okay. So Locals don't... No, we're not living where the locals live, right? What I'm saying is we're living like a local from the point of view of we're not going into Changu. Okay, let me rephrase it. We're not living like tourists. Yeah. Right? If you don't want to call yeah. it living like a local, yeah, right, let's call it... We're not living inaccurate. like tourists, right? Because <laughs> we're not living in hurts, tourists. <laughs> tourists go to Changu, go to Batu Balong, go to Barawa, look for the cheapest guest house, look for the cheapest hostel, and then they spend 99% of their time in cafes at the gym. Like we have a space that I've searched for and managed to secure that has given us the place to chill, relax, have our own space, and then also be able to give us a good location so that we can go to Changu quite quickly. We can go to Prenanen, Kuta's not too far away. We can go the back route, et cetera, et cetera. You know, because I've literally today just secured my X Max for the next six months, and I've just paid up front. You know, so that's what we're going to be doing with the with the the house in probably October time, because right now the prices are too steep. You know, and that's that's one thing I will say is that if anyone is looking to move abroad, don't go in high. Don't season. Don't go in like the middle of summer because you're going to be met with extortionate villa prices, extortionate rental prices for your transportation all because the demand is so fucking high at those times of the year, right? So if anybody is thinking about moving, I would hold fire for the next couple of months and organize it all in September, October, when everything's calmed down, the tourists have fucked off, so that you can actually get fair price and good value for money. Because that is literally what is, I've already, I'm already seen it happening, even in the past month, like, the properties that were 40 mil are like now 35 mil, because high season is coming to an end, and like, beginning of August is when everyone starts to fuck off. So, yeah, I would say a couple more months, We'll probably stay where we're at for the next couple of months. Um, and then 
look to go out somewhere a little bit we more. We also want time. a little bit more space because yeah, we've got a one bed. It's all right. It does it does the it's, job? It's great. It you is know? nice. It's not bad for coming here on five days' notice. So yeah. like the plan was for me, right? Let's get an Airbnb. Let's give me give me five days, and I literally within those five days, I broke my balls to like find a place. Did about fifteen viewings, and I was like, cool. I found this place, relatively well priced at twenty three million, which is about a thousand one hundred pound. For what you get for the area that you're in, it's spot on, right? A lot of people that I know are paying forty million yeah, for something at pretty same. much the same spot, yeah. same space, and it like it's in a shit location. So, yeah, that's the uh, that's the main thing. So if you are if you are someone that is genuinely interested about Bali and about moving the logistics, if you're a girl, speak to Esther. If you're a lad, speak to me. You know, because if you are a girl and you speak to me, I'm just going to fold you onto air anyway. So, <laughs> like, one few men in my life's enough. So. Like for me, it's about understanding like, right, we're in here now. How do we navigate the next two years? Not just make a decision on the next three months. Like how do the next 18 months look, right? And that's why I've done the visa path that I've done so that I've got the next 18 months secured so I don't have to worry about it. Yes, I can, I'm gonna have to take a couple of trips to the immigration office, but that's that, right? And for me, on the X-Max, it takes only 25 minutes. It's quite a nice drive. So I don't mind doing that. Like I said, I did it this morning, I went there, so I left, I left at nine, right, just to give you, because you actually don't know. I no, left at I know. nine. When you said it was done, it was like 40 minutes after. Yeah. So I came there, got the got the uh, the photo taken, got my fingerprints done, and I was it's out. quick, isn't it? Rapid. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, it was, uh, I'm doing actually a little reel on the Instagram to show you guys today. You know, because yesterday didn't quite go to plan, but I turned up at the immigration office, and they were like, it's not ready. And I was like, okay, I'll come back tomorrow. So, yeah. The, uh, the main thing as well... <laughs> with living in Bali, you got to understand it's a whole different way of operation. Everything works so differently, right? How, how have you seen it? Because you obviously work in Elite and you actually have more time around. Like, well, I place. mean, for me, it's, it's very different to the UK. Like in the UK, there's quite a lot of, like even things, things aren't equal in the UK, don't get me wrong, but there's a lot more things in place, laws in place between, quality in terms of pay something i really noticed that's very very common here is locals don't get paid nowhere near as much as westerners which i personally really don't like it's the same with like living arrangements and like cafes and stuff i really don't like it but i just try and not think about it too much but in terms of like general living you can do everything on whatsapp which in the uk is unheard of like i was speaking to one of the um the girls that goes to the gym and she's from the UK, she's from London. She was like, she's going to go back in September to visit family. No, um, this girl called Liam. Um, and she was like, oh my God, it's going to be so weird that I can't just message like a restaurant on WhatsApp going, yeah. oh, can you book us in for this evening? Like, yeah. and it's like little things, like you get a delivery, like well, I've got an Ikea parcel, which God knows what's happening too, but I got an Ikea parcel and the delivery guy's like, hi, I've got your parcel. Can you send me your actual location just to make sure that it matches? Like everything is done on WhatsApp. If you want to book anything, if you want to know anything, it's all on WhatsApp, which is so wild because in the UK, that's nothing it's email or call in the uk i feel like especially with like businesses um another thing as well is like there's no there's not really a lot of franchises out here apart from like starbucks no but even but even then there's even like, then i've it's, like, seen like two yeah like everything is independent so and you the networking possibilities in bali is second to none like every day i'm speaking to someone who's owning something or, or like i don't know they've I don't know, like, it's just crazy. Like, they've got a cafe or they've got a massage parlour or they've got a studio or, like, in the UK, you're literally just talking to someone who's just got a random job. That's it. Yeah. Here, everyone is business-minded, which, when you're self-employed, is quite inspiring because even now, we're like, oh, well, should we set up, like, a business here? Well, I was and, like, talking to you about a coffee shop. So I went, yeah. so I went to a coffee place called uh, Four. Um, and it was like the best coffee I've had here. It was so nice. I got a Manuka Americana, which is crazy. Manuka honey, right? Manuka honey, yeah. yeah. I think so anyway, yeah. And I said to Esther, I was like, this is the nicest coffee. And I was like, can you quickly do me a favor and just check if there are any four coffee places near us? And she was like, no, they're all miles away. And I said, let's fucking open one then. Like, let's franchise it and let's bring it to Prenanen or bring it to Changu, you know? Bring it closer because, uh, again, I don't know what the laws are, blah, 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 but... Yeah, I mean, had I been in the UK fresh out of the box and come here, I probably wouldn't have had that, even that reply me. 
but having the conversation that I've had. But it's because you, we now know See, after possible. speaking to people, so like like I said, speaking to like there's a guy in the gym. He's literally opened up. A, he's from Australia. He's literally opened up a whole cafe, and like it's I spoke, I it's spoke, amazing. yeah, we got Ben, Ben, Ben and Claire. Um, <laughs> be on a podcast. Um, yeah, so I spoke to Claire, and she was like, yeah, it literally just kind of happened out of nowhere because they've not even been in Bali that long. Yeah, I know. So she's like, oh, it just happened kind of out of nowhere, and it's and like, just. You, <laughs> you have are. those you have those conversations with And yeah, and people. I have these conversations and I'm like, well what's what's stop it is then? Yeah, hundred percent. Just money. Yeah. It's literally just m- money money's the only barrier of entry here. Nothing political, nothing We know locals, we know locals that can yeah, help. I'm very good with the friends. <laughs> I'm very good friends now with my the boss. Yeah. <laughs> We've been training a couple of times <laughs> together. You've probably seen him. Putu. Big man. <laughs> He's fucking savage. He's actually savage. I love him. He's so like, like Balinese people and, and Indonesians. They're so to the point. They're oh so black yeah. And, white. and I'm black and white, so I love it. Yeah. Like, so do I. Well, we come so from easy. Eastern European households. I feel like that's quite normal. Yeah. Well, Germans and Lu- Lithuanians they are very similar. Yeah. Like, they say artists. We're not pansies like the UK. <laughs> A lot of people in the UK are so like grey and like oh this and that. It's oh, like shut up, baby. Mate. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe this. Maybe that. Yeah. So like that. That's part of the uh, the planet for us moving forward. The long term. I'd get a dog. <sighs> Yeah, we'll get a dog. There's so many dogs around here. I mean, I had one on the bike the other day. Yeah, she just, she Marley, just she came on. Home. It's like this dog who's got like a disabled tongue, right? Aww. It's just like flops on the outside. Yeah, but that's so cute. And um, she, she loves me now. Like when I went to pick up some, some bagels from that place, she was looking for me. And uh, she, I took her for another spin. So I, I just, think that's the worst thing in my opinion about Bali. That's 100%. If you're like an animal dog enthusiast, then my God, be prepared to just walk around with blinkers. Um, because there are stray dogs everywhere, and some of them really are in really bad shape. That's like, oh no, I just want to take them all home, and I want to feed them all, and I do feed them all, but yeah, it's not, it's not good. Yeah, what I want to wrap up the podcast with is our relationship from a personal and professional point of view, and how how we it's separate developed. the two. No. Yeah, because obviously, like, I, I. I do the business mentor now, yeah. But the only first because you helped me first, and you're like, oh, maybe I should help more people. The first, the first opportunity that I really had was was you mm-hmm. to like flex my knowledge on someone who's completely fresh out the bat. Completely fresh, and basically the 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 time and a place where you have the most influence, right? If somebody's coming to you with a clean slate, fresh out of the box, and doesn't know the industry, doesn't know what to do. That is where I find the most fulfillment as a mentor, where I can actually really mold someone's mentality, mold someone's business, their service, the, the value that they provide. And for you, it was the first opportunity to really do that. But at the same time, it came at the cost of our actual romantic relationship. 100%. And I think you will be in a better position than I will, due to my memory, on how that that really has developed and how that was really... Well, I mean, obviously, going back to when we actually broke up to begin with, another big reason was because, like, all we'd speak about is business. And I was like, am I actually your girlfriend, though? Because right now, I just feel like all we do is talk about growing business, business. It was just dead. It was just dead vibes. I mean, it's good now and again, but my God, if that's all that consumes your relationship, then you're not really in a relationship anymore because you were very emotionally cut off at that point. So I think for you, the only thing that you really could talk about is is business. And it's great because it's your passion and now you know that. Yeah. But at the time, especially when we were so so fresh as a couple, I was just like, oh my God, <laughs> can you just simmer? But you know what it is? <laughs> right? Let me just be completely Chill. honest with you here, right? That was me showing my love to you. Yeah, it's I get. Like, I mean, I get that, but at the same genuinely. time, it's just a bit thick. No, but like, no, it's it's laying it on thick, right? And it's it's basically taking my support for you to the nth degree and the extreme. And I think when, rather than oh, here's a cuddle. Yeah, so like men <laughs> like, and women, which I at the time really wanted. Yeah. <laughs> you were just like, no, Esther, let's get you to fifty clients. <laughs> men like, and women <laughs> operate very very differently, right? <laughs> And if someone in your position at the time that we were together comes to me with a bunch of problems and you want the pathway to the solution, then me showing my love to you will be very, very, very centered around helping you and providing you with those solutions to those potential problems. And I think as a stoic male in general, and a lot of people listening to this will understand, like the best way that we as men can show love is by providing solutions, protecting and providing. 
And I took that a bit too far and was like, right, the only way that I can offer value to Estee is by being a business mentor <laughs> and by helping her. But then you realize, hang on a minute, actually, she wants to be with me for me. <laughs> she wants to be with me because she loves me and all this sort of stuff. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, shit, I can actually give more than just <laughs> advice on business. And that's one thing that I realized after we broke up. I was like, right, okay, cool. What else can I bring to the table? Because I know I can develop her business. I know I can help her implement strategies and implement tools. And to be fair, one of the best things that we did was separate it for a long time. And I said, right, you go off and work with a business mentor. If you need my help, I will help, but the input will be far less. And that allowed us to actually develop and grow 100%. a romantic relationship and just a relationship in general, right? Yeah, I'm not saying that romance was dead, by the way. But it was. It was just shown style. in a different way, I think. Yeah, it was just a different style of yeah. of uh, relationship, and now it's very much. I don't know. I'd say we're pretty we're pretty complete in terms yeah, of how we're solid now. Operates. We've been for a lot. <laughs> yeah, that's I feel like we're like tried and tested. And I think do you know Perhaps. what it is? Yeah? If ever, if any, if anyone like People dying, if anyone like <laughs> My God. thinks that they're not compatible with their partner, like just go through a bit of trauma. Yeah, <laughs> go through shit. <laughs> go through shit together, and then you'll really find <laughs> if you want to be with that person. Because like, I think. Three times, and I think you, the way that you were with me and my dad dying and the support, that's when I was like, okay, I can see myself putting a ring on this, right? Oh, so You heard it here, folks. Yeah, no, no, no it's on a real though. Do you know what I mean? It's like, that's the first time you think about it and you go, okay, cool. That's the next step. Because that's the next step, right? Like, I'm not really... I'm not really fussed about marriage. You're not really fussed about marriage. I think neither of us are. I'm not fussed about but... kids. You're not fussed about nah. kids. Like in the meantime, we could do plenty of practice in, nah. but we don't really want to be jeopardizing our situation and, and essentially ruining our life for the next 18 years because that's really what happens when you have a kid. I think as well, like in this day and age when you're, you've got literally the world at your fingertips, quite literally through like social media, online businesses, you'd just be silly. You'll just be silly. You'll just get a little you. No. You won't be able to do this. No, nah, it's not that. <laughs> and like, I get a very, very good insight into how it is to be a parent through my brother. <laughs> and like, I love, I love Tyler. I'm, a, I'm his uncle, right? He's and so I'm, he's gonna grow up to see me as the fun uncle, right, for a long time of his life. So I'm, I'm very much looking forward to, to being that, right? But my word, every time I see him, I'm like, he's eating dirt. Kev, you have stones. to put up with a lot of shit, man. And I just think karma's got a funny way of biting you in the ass. And I was a shit ass. And kid. I was too. So. I was a proper shit ass kid. I think. Yikes! If you were to pop one out, it would be a fucking death on wheels. Honestly, <laughs> absolute death on toddler sticks. Like fuck, we'd get it. We'd get it. Karma double double bubble. Yeah. yeah. So that, in terms of future aspirations, the uh, the kids can wait. The dog will be a, an intermediary to that, and then just building the business to the point where. We're very, very happy. Well, in the ultimate goal is to have multiple streams of income. Let's be yeah, honest. Yeah, we're already getting there. You know? We've got three. Well, I've got three. Have you? Yeah. The coach University, the coaching, and then Elite Subs. Oh, I mean, oh, I don't really count Elite Subs. Why don't you count Elite? It literally pays for the rent. Yeah, I know, but you do all that. It doesn't really, doesn't really go into my... Yeah, so basically, we've pants. got three streams of income. If we were to pool our resources, we've got then three we've got four streams. then. Cause then we've got my coaching too. Okay, four. So then we've got four between the two of us. You know, two of them are in the same business. One of them is an extension of the coaching, which is the business mentoring. And then the elite subs, which is we are very 50-50 in. You know, you take care of the girls, I take care of the lads. There's a, there's a little bit of a crossover. Like you look after Will, I look after Katie. You know, we, we, work, we work well together in that aspect, you know. And you know, we're building the team where we're building a, a strong team of, of athletes with the elite subs stuff and... You know, again, the more you do business, the more you understand how you can delegate, outsource, and actually be an entrepreneur. Because I think online coaches, I wouldn't really class them as entrepreneurs. I'd class them as solopreneurs, like people who are running businesses but spend all of their waking day and all of their time pooling resources and pooling time and pooling finances into building that one business. That's not entrepreneurship. I mean, you do get some that are at that level, but yeah, yeah. But what I'm saying is, speaking, like, at yeah. some point, at some point, like, I'm now crossing into that. And going right, okay. My time is now spent. Like my time is now separated between three things on a monthly basis. Like my brain isn't just always thinking about online coaching. It's like 
okay, Tuesday, Wednesday, I'm a business mentor. Monday, I'm a content creator. Thursday, I'm a content creator. Friday, Saturday, I'm an online coach. And then in between that, you've got your messaging support, you've got your replies to your clients, your mentees, you know? So it's again, finding that balance. And I've been able to really find a very, very good balance with all of that. That makes me super productive, allows me to have some time resting, recovering. Like two days ago, I was actually at the recovery center at Elite for like four hours, just chilling, you know? So again, that's, um, but that's, that's how Bali can give you that, you know? Bali can allow you to work hard, play hard, right? It's so, not even that, it's just having an online, online business. Yeah, Don't it can take you anywhere around Take the world. your social media seriously, folks. Like, post that content, even if you've got 20 followers, post it, post it, because you just never know where it leads you. Like, you genuinely don't know. Yeah, if you're an online coach and you're scared to get in front of the camera, you are fucked. Because it's part of the job. Like, a lot of the people, like, I feel like a lot of people think, oh, it's just you get clients. Well, how are you going to get clients? You get clients online. You need to be content creator. Like, it's part of the job. The way that you're going to get people interested in you is by documenting your journey. And that needs to be filmed on a camera. And the best way to film on a camera and provide your journey and actually provide insight into who you are is by getting yourself in front of the camera. Yes, you can be a faceless coach or yes you can be a reels coach that does like little snippets with music on the top but that will only ever penetrate your audience so far you need to make sure that you're comfortable getting in front of a camera documenting your journey speaking on your journey just like we are and being able to give that level of insight so that people can look at your content understand the purpose of your messaging understand who you are buy into you because before they've even bought into your service trust me they've bought into you as a person they trust you and the ultimate goal for any businessman and for any coach is to be able to reach that level of influence where you can shit in a bag and sell it, right? You've got multiple examples of how that is operating in the industry right now, like trained by JP. The geezer could shit in a bag and sell it and people would pay good money for that shit because he's created a cult-like community where there is the trained by JP way, right? And then that's just one very, very good example that a lot of people understand. And he's been building that shit for years. And then you've got people who will literally take that community-based way of developing your audience and copy and paste that shit and just bring their own personality to the table. And that's what's really important to understand as an online coach. You're not going to do anything that hasn't already been done, but you need to do it with your own style, with your own authenticity. And that's really what's going to separate yourself because why be anybody else other than yourself because everybody else has already taken, right? So... I think that's a very, very good way to end the podcast. Would you like to add anything else, Este? No, just do you, innit? You do you, boo-boo. <laughs> and chase those dreams, you know? Chase the bag. N nothing, nothing's impossible. Like, it actually isn't. We're very, good, uh, we're very good examples of that because you come don't from come nothing. from anything. I don't come from anything. I mean, at the end of the day, I'm a fucking immigrant. <laughs> I'm not quite there. I'm like 50-50. <laughs> Technically, immigrant. I've got a German passport. You've got a Lithuanian passport. We aren't actually UK citizens. But we've managed to make a life for ourselves from very little opportunity. We didn't have parents who were multimillionaires. We didn't have parents who ran businesses. We've had to pay people money for advice and take that advice, interpret that, do our own research, apply it, and practice every single day for the last three years on how to build a business. And that's the only way that you're going to build the business is getting yourself out there. You know, you can't learn to drive a car by sitting in neutral and parking it in Tesco's. You know, you have to get out on the road. You have to drive on the roads to understand how to really drive a car. So the same applies to business. You need to make sure that you start your business, learn shit as you go along. Because that's what we're doing, you know? Oh, we're still we, learning we, every day now. We come across like we've got everything figured out. Do we fuck? Absolutely not. We're still picking up I things. feel like I'm still a baby in it, to be we're honest. We're just getting warmed up. Like, I mean? I'm 27, you're 26, you soon to be 27. And I got to like the age of 25 and I was like, fuck, I need to have everything figured out by the time I'm 25. That's not the case. Oh, I thought I'd be married with children at 25. Well, how's that going for you? <laughs> Things have changed. It's a better life though, I'll tell you that now for free. It's not, it's not on the agenda. So if you, think, if you think that anything's genuinely stopping you right now, trust me, nothing is. And I'll go back to it, like if you are an online coach right now who's living with your parents, you've got nothing to lose. Go and experience the world because the UK is a very, very, very small fraction of the world. And let me tell you now, the world is a beautiful place. It's a big place. So go out and explore it and use online coaching to allow that 
to happen and you can be a coach from anywhere in the world. You can be in Spain, you can be in the Philippines, you can be in Thailand, you can be in Australia, you can be in Bali, anywhere you want, right? You just got a graft, you just got to sacrifice for that goal. And if you don't know how to, message me and I'll help you through the Coach University and through the one-to-one -one business mentoring. And that, peace out, my people, is the end of today's episode. Thank you very much, Este. Thanks for having me. Peace out, my people.